Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, they could Skype as well, but, oh, yeah. okay. but this gets recorded, so I set yours up. If you mess mine up, Skype. <laughs> so how am I supposed to handle the link to Manas? Yeah, right. Okay, now it works. I got her. It's a link up. I set yours up. You messed mine up. Kiko, cheesh. Hey, how are you? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just like little, little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Sylvester. Uh, so. Oh, yeah, so we are online. Uh, uh, email or what? So, oh, you see us? Yeah, there's probably it's a little slow, so usually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we are yeah. online. Uh, okay, but you see it. Uh, okay, and you can hear us. Uh, what? Okay, right. right. Oh, you see us? Yeah, there's oh, I can see the light. It's yeah, slow, I can hear myself speaking yeah, for the few seconds today. But uh, that's probably it. That's I, fine, it. It's I mean, once I'm not on the phone. Okay, can you hear us? Okay, great. Okay, great. Oh, I can see the
need a phone to touch a phone with that. So, but then, how, well, how do, what do I do to get rid of it? Maybe. Oh, can I turn the, no, I cannot turn the speakers off, can I? Oh, yeah, turn the speakers off. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Put the volume away. Hello? Now it's gone. Okay, yeah. Now it's gone. Well, the, for us, our, the speakers are off for us. No, no speakers are not off. Oh. Oh, so maybe the phone is off. If she's there, my speaker off. So, now you have to go. You can, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, that's, that's, that's all. Okay. I'm hanging up. See ya? Okay. Chicken. Okay, thank you. 910, I'll call my mom's phone. Okay, 910. That's now. I know. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Have you guys met? Look, all the committee members. That's Kate. This is right. Professor Austin. Sorry, I'm doing like a completely improper introduction. This that's Kate. That's Austin. Um, then you won't step on the cord. Don't trip on the cord. Don't trip on the cord. Don't trip on the cord. Don't I, I need the music. Like the slide, 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 slide. That's there. Hello. Ha ha ha. Okay. Ha 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 ha. Let us have everything set. Okay. 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 Everything is set. Take a step back. Okay. Ha ha ha. it's not it won't switch the slides a bit yeah, because it doesn't have the that battery looks dead. Oh no, wait a second. Uh, oh, but it won't. No, I guess it won't. Yeah. It needs to have this. Uh, this one. Yeah. So how do you? I don't care. Never used this. Ah. No, I guess not. How do I? I just connect that to speak with the computer. At the back, there's a cute little button saying connect, but uh, it doesn't. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is I don't know. All right. Go ahead, go ahead. It, it doesn't say. You can probably tap your way through. Uh, worst way. No, it's fine. Because yeah. I, I can just hold that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Can you guys even see this? Like the I guess not. This was a lot. Yeah, how are you? The bread is very bright. Yeah, yeah. 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 That will be a little more prominent. So if you stand there, can we stand by the table? Can we see you then? I'll go back and forth. Right. It's probably good for them to see you. Put my phone in case it starts ringing. Okay. I, I turned it. Oh. Did you call your parents? You sent them yes. the link? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I might steal your phone. Back to my phone. But steal. They're silent. I think so. That's why I saw it. So. Smile most of the time, but then randomly I'll frown at you. No, like, he's not doing that. Frowns are scary. He doesn't even like look at you. Like he doesn't look at you when he frowns. He like looks like this. I look like you were. Like I look like you were more of a frown. Yeah, exactly. He's just scary. You <laughs> really just think he's a horrible person. No, he's not that friend. One of the two. Well, if you're not ready, it doesn't matter because we're going to start. So this has been a very happy week for me, um, working, uh, having the defense yesterday of Lorescu uh, in computer science. And uh, today we have uh, Monty Potter, a pleasure to have worked with her. And uh, her topic is the strange logic of golf and quantum trees. So Monty, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for attending my defense. So I'm going to talk about the strange logic of Galvin walks and trees. Let me first and foremost emphasize this part that I'm a probabilist. So what's the role of logic in there in the title? So I borrow properties 
that are parametrized nicely by mathematical logic and then study that in the setting of this very well-known stochastic process, which is the galton watson branching process. So that's the role that logic will play, and we will study two classes of properties that are parametrized by logic. Okay, so the first um, part of the talk will be just a brief introduction, or more like a well, more like a reminder of what the Alvin Watson process means. And the first class of properties we will study, which is the first order properties. So I'll define that by some examples. Um, let's do that. So, so before I start, let me emphasize here that uh, most of my results get extended to very general offspring distributions. So as long as they have all exponential moments. So as long as they're not heavy tailed, we, we should be fine. But for the sake of this talk, we'll just focus on Poisson lambda because computationally it actually makes our life simpler in certain ways. But the key ideas of the proof don't really differ on the big on because of Poisson lambda assumption. Okay, so what is the galton watson branching process uh, with Poisson lambda offspring distribution? So you start with uh, a single individual, which is known as the root, and then you let it have Poisson lambda many children. If it ends up having any child at all, then you let those children have mutually independent Poisson lambda many children, and so on you continue. So this gives rise to a tree. This kinds of uh, tree processes have been used to analyze uh, family trees. So Galton and Watson used this to model um, the family trees of uh, the royal families of the UK, I suppose. Uh, so I denote that by uh, sub lambda do not do to emphasize the dependence on this the mean lambda of the optimal distribution but sometimes I'll drop this so because lambda is fixed here right so this process can continue forever with positive probability when lambda is bigger than one when lambda is less than or equal to one this will terminate almost surely okay so this is where Poisson actually plays a nice role. It makes our lives easier because we will use a property of Poisson distribution known as Poisson thin. So, uh, just to give an example of, uh, just to start with an example. So, let's suppose you, you have a village where every woman can give birth to Poisson lambda many children, and each child is equally likely to be a boy or a girl. Then, the number of male children will follow, follow Poisson lambda over two. The number of female children will also follow Poisson lambda over two. And very important, these two random variables are going to be mutually independent. So, as you can see, the means get thin by probability half because it's equally likely to be a boy or a girl. Of course, this property can be generalized. So, here's the general definition of Poisson thinning. Uh, suppose you have a population where the individuals can be categorized into k classes with these probabilities, and uh, each individual gives birth to Poisson lambda many children. So then if xi is the number of children in category i, then uh, x1 through xk, these random variables are mutually independent, and each of them has a Poisson marginal where the mean has been thinned by the correct probability. Yeah. So this general property is known as Poisson thin. Okay, uh, let's talk about first order properties. So if I'm to give a one-line introduction to what first order properties stand for, uh, they are able to capture local finite structures inside the tree. So that's a one-line introduction, but we should go through the logical, uh, the mathematical logical definition of it. But I will not, I don't want to get caught up for too long in, uh, in logical formalism. We will actually illustrate things through examples and uh, a short summary in the next one. So any logical language, language consists of some symbols, some of them are variables, some of them are constant, so, uh, consists of uh, relations, consists of Boolean connectives, and quantifications. So in this particular case, the constant symbol is the root. So how would you visualize what this means? Well, this means that um, the root is a special vertex. It's like the king of vertices. It's not to be confused with the other inferior vertices. That's how you should um, visualize this. There are two relations. One is the equality of two nodes. The other one is the parent child relationship, which I denote by this notation. So if pi of y equals x, then x, the, the node x is the parent of the node y. So these are two very naturally occurring relations in the setting of root trees. The variable symbols are always vertices in the tree. 
uh, we have the issue of Boolean connectives of disjunction, conjunction, or union intersection, negation, implication, etc. And then we have quantification universal for all and uh, existential, there exists. But I have written this part in bold for a reason. So first order properties only allow quantification of vertices and not subsets of vertices. What that means is the following. This is the reason why they're able to capture only local structures. They cannot capture global structures. But we will illustrate that for example. There is one more notion that I should mention here because it comes because we have to keep referring back to that. So there is the notion of quantifier depth associated with any first order property, which is the minimal number of nested quantifiers you require to express the property. Okay, so it would be much better if I illustrate by examples. Suppose you ask for the property. So this property A asks for, does there exist a node somewhere inside the tree which has exactly one child and one grandchild? So this is a local structure. This is, it, it's possible to capture this by a first order properties. Or let's say you, you talk about some local structure not happening. So the root has no child with no child with no child. This is my advisor's favorite example. Uh, it's also a very important landmark in my life because he asked me to, so, to find out if this property is true for my grandmother as the root and my family tree before I could actually become a student. So <laughs> I solved this, so it's an important uh, property in my life. Uh, also, um, this, uh, this you can just examine three generations down from the root in order to check if this property is true or not. So it's a local structure, you can capture this by first order. Or you can talk about the root having exactly two children. You know, this is just cooking up examples. So one of which is childless, the other has exactly three children. Again, if you go to two generations down from the root, it's possible to capture this uh, by a first order. So time to summarize, typically the kind of properties I'm looking at, well, they are generally of these two kinds. So you fix a finite tree, T naught, and you ask for you ask the question. Does the entire tree contain a copy of T naught somewhere? Okay. So is there is there a subtree inside the entire tree which is isomorphic to T naught? So this is a local structure. You can capture this by first order. Or you can specify a certain neighborhood of the root from happening or not happening, a certain finite radius neighborhood, and this is again first order. So the reason why I have mentioned these two separately is again because the root is special. So what happens around the root is not to be confused with what happens deep down inside the tree. So hopefully that gives you an idea about the kind of uh, properties we can capture by a first order language. Uh, let's look at my favorite example. So we started out by trying to analyze this example. Uh, this was the first example in the previous slide. So you were asking for the property that there is a node somewhere inside the tree, which is exactly one child and one grandchild. So how would I go about analyzing this property? Well, I want to partition the space of all root trees into three classes or three colors, green, yellow, and red. And how do I do that? So here's uh, a picture. I don't know if, it's, uh, if there's enough light uh, to see this. So I color the root of a tree green if it satisfies property A. So this symbol here is a, it's a very standard symbol used by logicians to, to denote that a property gets satisfied. So you color the root of a tree green if, if there is a node inside the tree which has exactly one child and one grandchild. Um, you color the, the root of a tree yellow if it has exactly one child, but the subtree coming out of the child does not satisfy property A. Okay? And then everything else you throw into the red plots. So this is a well-defined partition. So why do I do that? Well, because of this. I want to be able to tell my color if you give me the colors of my children. So how would I do that? So look at this one. If you have, if you are a root that has at least one green child, you are green, because this smaller subtree satisfies property A. Therefore, the bigger subtree will also satisfy property A. So that's the first rule here. So if you have at least one green child, you are green. If you are a root that has exactly one yellow child, no red, no green child, then this yellow child, if you match from this. Uh, if you look at this picture, this yellow child has exactly one child, and the subtree coming out of that does not satisfy property B. But then you yourself have exactly one child and one grandchild, so you end up being green. So that's the second rule. So one yellow, no green, no red, makes you green. And finally, if you have exactly one red child, 
well, this subtree will not satisfy property A, but now you will have the same picture as this one, therefore you're yellow. So one red, no green, no yellow gives you yellow. So those uh, give you the deterministic set of the set of deterministic rules that tell you your color if you know the colors of your children. So using these rules, so if, if X is the probability of being of the root being painted green, and Y that of the root being painted yellow, then okay, then the probability that the root gets painted red is just one minus X minus Y. So you are trying to solve for two unknown variables. So using these rules and using Poisson thinning, you can actually form these equations. So even without the assumption of Poisson, you would be able to form these equations, but they would be more complicated. If you solve these equations, you find that the solution is unique and it's a smooth function of lambda. So here's a plot of one minus x. I did it long back and I did it with one minus x, so I didn't change that, but it shows you that the, that the function is smooth, okay? And it's a unique solution. Yeah. So I'm curious if you relax on assumption, do you still need some assumption on the child distributions? Like you mentioned earlier, I have a, uh, like no heavy tail. Okay, so nothing here. Well, the, the child, so it has to be like a nice distribution in the sense that it has exponential moments. I think that's, so when I did the general analysis, that's what I required. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't think we need an assumption. Um, and yeah, this was reviewed by people in the paper, so hopefully it's good. Uh, okay. In contrast, uh, let's look at a property which is not first order, and let's see how things can differ. So let's look at this very well-studied property of immortality of the tree, survival of the tree. Um, you can go about trying to analyze things using these color classes again, but you would need only two colors, green and red. So you're green if you have an infinite tree coming out of you, you're red otherwise. So of course, the rules are way simpler now, so if you have at least one green child, you're green, otherwise you're red. So once again, if X is the probability of survival, then you can form uh, this classical equation using Poisson theory. But when you solve for X, you find that the solution is not unique when lambda is bigger than one. There is the false zero solution, and then there is the positive true solution. Moreover, at lambda equals one, this is not differentiable because the right hand derivative is two and the left hand derivative is zero. Uh, and this is not a first order property. This is this falls into the class of existential monadic second order properties, or EMSOs because it's a mouthful, uh, which we will study in the last section of my talk, or we will talk about. So here's a plot. That's the false solution. That's the true solution. Okay. Um. So, where are we trying to get here from now? I want to be able to tell that. The nice thing about the nice thing that you observe for this particular property that is uniquely solvable and smoothness in lambda, whether that extends in general to first order properties or not, that's what I'm trying to show. So the, the so my results on first order probabilities are in two parts. This one will show that yes, it's uniquely solvable because we get it as the fixed point of a contracting map, and. Uh, the second part is finding the probabilities of first order properties conditioned on survival of the tree. So, okay. Uh, the logicians came up with, I think the logicians came up with, uh, this brilliant uh, bridge that connects mathematical logic with structural description of these logical properties uh, in the setting that you're studying them. So in our case, it's root of trees. Uh, so essentially, it's boiling things down to common rhetorics and not doing mathematical logic. So these are known as Aaron Ford games. So let's uh, describe the games. So these games are full information games. So this is the this is the most standard version that is required for first order property analysis. Uh, so let's just try that. So there are two players: spoiler and duplicator, named by my advisor, and I think he agrees. These are very very apt names because spoiler is just trying to mess with the duplicator, and it's just trying to prevent her from winning. So they start with two trees, so these are deterministic trees, not random here, with uh, two given roots, and these roots, like I said, are special vertices, uh, and the number of rounds of space, so all these quantities are known to both the players when they start the game. Um, every round consists of both the spoiler and duplicator participating. So the spoiler makes a move, and the duplicator replies with move. The spoiler is the player with the greater, greater degrees of freedom, because in every round, he can select either of the two trees and then pick a node from the tree. 
the duplicator has to choose a node from the other tree. So uh, let's say that xi is the node picked from the tree t1 and yi from t2 in round i. Let me clarify here because I have faced multiple questions. Uh, there has been a confusion sometimes that xi is not necessarily the node picked by spoiler because spoiler can go back and forth between the two trees. This is the node picked from t1 in round i, and this is the node picked from t2 in uh, round i. Okay, so uh, not necessarily spoiler and duplicator in that order. Uh, we have this convention of setting the zeroth pair to be the roots because the roots are special and you need to take them into account in the game. So when does the duplicator win the game? She has to maintain two conditions throughout the game. The first is the parent-child relationship among these pairs. So if xi is the, pair, is the parent of xj, then that must mean that yi is the parent of yj and vice versa for all ij. And then the second one is the equality of nodes. So if xi equals xj, then yi must equal yj and vice versa. So these are the two relations that we encounter in the definition of first order language in our case. So these are the two things that duplicator needs to maintain. And I'll use this notation to denote here and for a deal of key rounds. Uh, I'm abbreviating things by EHR because Aaron points a big word to write. But in case you guys need to like refer to that written it here, in case uh, it creates confusion later on. Um, so what's the connection? So we have to discuss yeah. What's a good strategy for the duplicator? Like, uh, if I were playing this game, what would I try to do? So <laughs> essentially the, the, the point of this game is that the spoiler is trying to show that the, the two trees are very different in some sense, so in the first order sense. And the duplicator is trying to show that the trees are not so different. So if so, if I, I, if I can illustrate by an example, say, so, um, let's, suppose, let's play a short game. So let's say that the number of rounds is two. And you have something like, this is the first tree, and this is, say, the, the second tree, duplicator won't be able to win this game because here there is one leaf node, there are two leaf nodes here. And uh, the, the duplicator will be in trouble trying to, so if the, if the spoiler picks, um, so say the spoiler picks this node, and the duplicator picks this one, uh, let's see, uh, I have to think a little bit, so, yeah, the spoiler can pick, this node and the duplicator will have to pick this one. Uh, yeah, and then say duplicator picks this one and the spoiler picks this one. What will the duplicator pick now? So if he picks this one, then its parent child relationship is not satisfied. Okay? So yeah, so these are fundamentally different because there are two such branches here, there is one such branch branch here. So the, du the duplicator won't be able to win a two-round game. So, you know, there are examples like that where the trees are, are actually different and the duplicator won't be able to win. Um, yeah, this is a, a very simple example, but hopefully that kind of answers Can you go back to the previous the slide? Yeah. Slide. Yes. So, the so this is. If they manage to duplicate that percentage. Can you say it again? So the duplicator wins if they manage to duplicate that percentage. Yeah, but does, that doesn't mean that the trees have to be isomorphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is supposed to be for all i. Yes, for all i j. Yeah, I guess I, I say it out loud. Yeah, it's for all i j. Yes, starting from zero to k. Should I work? Okay. So, uh, I. So okay. First of all, this k will be will be arbitrary but fixed from the beginning. So I'm I'm often not going to mention that it's there. It's it's going to be there as a fixed. Is a fixed positive integer. So I can define a relation on the set of on the space of all the trees uh, by this definition. So if two trees are said to be related, if duplicator wins the corresponding K-round error point game on the, on those two trees. Um, so nice it's nice to show that this is an equivalence relation. Uh, this is just for the sake of uh, referring back later on. So this is a nice name we give to the equivalence class, which contains a particular tree T. So the equivalence class uh, is called its Aaron Point value. So we'll talk about it. Does, the, does that mean the duplicator has a winning strategy? Yes, 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 yes. 
for any the any uh, move, whatever the spoiler does, the duplicator has a, a reply strategy which helps her win. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, the spoiler has like way more freedom than the duplicator. Okay, so we will call the equivalence class that contains a particular tree, it's error point value, and I'll keep referring back to it once again, abbreviating things as EHR. So this is crucial. So once you fix k, the number of equivalence classes is finite. It's a tower function of k, it's huge, but it's crucial that it's finite, otherwise our proofs will fall down. So uh, let's say that uh, sigma sub k, where I often drop this k again, because k is fixed, is the set of all such equivalence classes. I have written it here so that people can refer back. Sigma k is finite. That's super important. OK. But I still haven't shown you the connection between Eric White games and first order properties. Here is the well known theorem which makes the connection. So, two trees, if they belong to the same equivalence class in capital sigma, then they will satisfy the exact same set of first order properties of quantifier depth less than or equal to k. So, how does this help? This helps in the following way. If you pick a, a, an equivalence class, you can pick any tree out of the of the class, and that will be a representative of all the trees in the class. You just have to find out which first order properties of quantifier depth less than or equal to k satisfies, and that gives a complete description of all the trees in the class. So that's the theorem, and that's our main connection. So this, this is how it helps us do the general analysis instead of going through you know examples such as this. Of course, when the when the structure is more complicated, you cannot do this kind of case by case analysis. So this is our aim. We want to compute the probability that uh, the Galton-Watson tree belongs to any such equivalence class. Yeah, go ahead. Was the point about the finiteness that it's independent of the length of the tree? Independent of the length of the tree, what do you mean? Oh, like, so. The depth, yes. whatever yes. it's called. Yes. We look at the class of all trees, and then we find a number of equivalence For a given okay, case. Yeah, not an obvious result. No, it was, it was a very nice tree. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm interested in the probabilities of the Galton Watson tree belonging to the equivalence classes. Why? Because if you then give me any first order property, which is quantified depth less than equal to k, then I just need to find all equivalence classes sigma for which a is satisfied. And then I can just sum over their probabilities. So this sum it ranges over only those sigma. And that would give me the probability of the property A. So this gives a complete characterization of or probabilities of all first order properties. Okay. So that's our aim. And because we will come back to this, uh, this aim, I have written the things here. I've written the what we need to compute here. So in, in case you want to refer back to it. Um, okay. So but before we can do that. There is a recursion relation among Aaron Ford values that I need to explain. Uh, this is pretty much the only technical part, so I need to go through this a little slowly. Uh, the idea is the following. You give me a tree, and uh, so the root has all these children, and then there are subtrees coming out of these children. Now, you su suppose you tell me the Aaron Ford values of all these subtrees. What I want to be able to do is, without any randomness, Determine the error point value of the whole tree just on the basis of this information. So there is a recursion happening. Uh, so, and how is this possible? So let's look at the steps one by one, and then I'll explain with an example. So for every error for every equivalence class sigma, small sigma, in capital sigma, count the number of children that the root has, such that the corresponding subtree has error point value small sigma. Let's say that the number is n sub sigma. Skip the line here, I'll, I'll come back to it. We will look at this vector, which is not exactly just the value of n sub sigma, but rather looking at the minimum of n sub sigma and k. So it's like sort of a truncated vector. Uh, this vector will be what determines the error point value of the whole tree. Okay, so why do we why do we not care about values that are bigger than k? Well, a k around error for k cannot distinguish between values that are greater than or equal to k. Okay, it cannot distinguish between specific values. And here's an example how. Uh, so let's let's play a little game. Um, suppose k 
phase two again, so two rounds in the game. And uh, I will denote any any count which is greater than or equal to k, so greater than or equal to two by omega. So omega means many for us. So suppose we look at these two trees. So this is our t1 and this is our t2. So how can you describe t1? The root has one child with omega children because there are four of them. And then omega children each with one child. And then this one, again, the root has one child with omega children. Notice that the counts are different. Here there are four, there are three. But because I'm using this term, terminology, so and then the root has omega children each with one child. These two trees are different. They're not isomorphic, but the duplicator still wins the game because the duplicator just has to hang in there for two rounds. So why? OK, so if Spoiler selects anything from here, so there are four options for him, and there are three options here for the duplicator. But since there are two rounds, at most the scholar can choose two of them, and the duplicator has the option of choosing two. So she will win. Similarly for these branches that are isomorphic. So there are two of them here, three of them here, but since there are two rounds, the duplicator will not run into a trouble. OK, so that's why uh, a, 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 an error for a game of two rounds cannot distinguish between specific values that are greater than two, so three, four mean the same. So that's why we are only concerned with looking at uh, coordinates of this kind, so minimum of n, n sub sigma and k. So if k is 10, whether n sub sigma is 8 or 9 will matter, but it will not matter if it's 12 or 15. Okay. So that's the vector we are interested in. So here it is again, just to, just to keep it up there for everyone to recall. So this is the vector which determines the error defined value of the whole tree. So you actually end up getting a set of deterministic rules, gamma, which is a mapping from this set. Notice that you only go up to k, uh, to sigma. So, so that you give me the tree, I can find this vector n vector, and the gamma of n vector will give me the error defined value of the whole tree. So we will make crucial use of these rules. So here's how I want to accomplish this aim of computing this, uh, these probabilities. So let's say that capital D is the set of all probability distributions on capital sigma. So recall that, well, it's hidden now. So recall that sigma k is finite. So this is a finite dimensional simplex. Uh, I want to define a distributional map psi from D to itself in the following way. Um, start with any probability vector x vector in capital D. So take a root, start with a root. Let it have Poisson lambda many children. Here's the picture. So start with the root. Let it have Poisson lambda many children. So whatever realization you get. So attach to each of those children an Ehrenfeld value according to the probability vector x vector. That's the initializing vector. And do this mutually independently over, the, over all the children. Okay. So for every realization of this random procedure, you can use these rules, right? So you can use these rules gamma and the Ehrenfeld values you obtain at the children to, to get the induced Ehrenfeld value at the root. So that is what we call the induced Ehrenfeld value. But because the procedure is random, this uh, this Ehrenfeld value is also random. And it has, a, it, it has the induced distribution, which we denote by psi of x vector. So that's how I define the distributional map. So why is psi of any interest to us? Here's why. So recall that we were interested in computing this probability vector. This is obtained as a fixed point of psi. That's not surprising, because you are letting the root have Poisson lambda many children, and then you are attaching to each of the children uh, an Ehrenfeld value according to the correct distribution. That is the distribution under uh, Poisson lambda galvin watson measure. So when you purple it up, you get back the same measure. So this is why it's the fixed point of psi that still doesn't give us much. So that's where our result comes in. Uh, we were able to show that psi is a contraction. Therefore, this probability vector is the unique fixed point of psi. And, that's, and then using implicit function theorem, this probability vector turns out to be analytical now. So we also make use of contraction there. Uh, quick thanks to Yuval Paris here. So we initially just made sure that this is C infinity, but then he was like, wait, there is an analytic version of the implicit function theorem, so you can use that and get this strong result. Okay, 
So just a remark as I will not go into the proof unless someone asks about it. Read, read on them. What? Read on them. I can't hear you. I sorry, I can't real and real. Oh I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, I mean that yes. Uh so just a remark. Um that the proof techniques will vary a lot in the subcritical case and the critical and supercritical case. This is way more complicated than that one. Okay. Um, so here are our second set of results. Uh, these are the probabilities of the first order properties, condition, and survival of the tree. So as you may recall, although I have to actually state it again here, so for any finite t0, a of t0 is the property that there is a copy of t0 inside the tree. So, uh, condition on survival of the galvanic oxygen tree uh, turns out that for every T naught, A of T naught must hold almost surely, which means that all of them actually simultaneously hold. So, what this means is that almost surely any infinite realization of the galvanic oxygen process will contain all finite local structures inside it, wherever. So, making use of this point, we were able to show the following. So if you get rid of a bad set of infinite trees of measure zero, then what you're left with, you pick any infinite tree from the good set, and you just need to look down far enough from the root, and you will be able to determine completely what its error point value is. Why is that? Well, this one states that all local structures are present somewhere deep down in the tree. So all you have to care about is the root, which is the king of vertices, and what happens around the root. So you just need to look at uh, a neighborhood of large enough radius around the root in order to know what first order properties it will satisfy of quantified depth less than equal to k. Um, just a comment, so this can be slightly improved. We did improve it in our paper, but it's, uh, it's more complicated to write that, so I'm stuck to this. Um, but it, it, is, it is exponential, it cannot be improved uh, beyond that. Uh, so, just to summarize what I stated uh, uh, verbally, is that so given any first order property A of quantified of less than equal to K, there is a corresponding property A star, which just depends on this uh, local neighborhood of the root, so that the probability that A holds condition of survival is the same as the probability that A star holds. So you just need to look at this neighborhood, this large neighborhood. Okay. okay um, so of course, then in that case, the next question is: Can you compute the local the probabilities of these local neighborhoods? And we actually devised a recursive procedure of computing the probabilities condition of survival, where the recursion happens according to the depth from the from the root. Uh, and in the process, we found that the probabilities of these local neighborhoods condition of survival are actually nice functions of lambda and p sub lambda, which is the survival probability of the Galvin Watson tree. And it involves like combinations of polynomials and iterative exponent exponentials. Uh, so just a quick example of where iterative exponentiation can come in. We go back to the Professor Spencer's theory example. Uh, the root has no child with no child with no child, has the unconditional probability of this form. So there are three nested exponentiations happening. Uh, I haven't computed the conditional probability, but this gives you an idea of where terms like this can come from. Um, so I will show how this recursion, this recursive way of computation of the probabilities happen, uh, but just for the simplest possible case, from going from one generic, from going from radius one to radius two of the neighbor. So once again, fixing k, call any count which is greater than or equal to k as omega, like here. Um, call a child of the root of time i if it has exactly i children of its own. So i varies over this range. So you care about the specific values up to k minus 1, and anything greater than or equal to k is just many for us. So if xi is the number of children of, of the root of type i, then again we use Poisson thinning. This is critically where Poisson thinning gets used, you know, just to give us nicer uh, expressions. Uh, but it's not crucial. This can be done without the assumption. Uh, so xi will follow a Poisson distribution, which is thinned by the correct probability, and uh, all these x1, x0 through x omega are mutually independent. So because they're mutually independent, so if you specify to me a radius to neighborhood of the root, then you are actually specifying the values of capital X item. 
So then I can write the probability of this neighborhood out in this product form. Okay, so it's really nice. Uh, here's an illustration. So when k equals 3, let's look at this neighborhood. So there are omega many children of type 1, one child of type 2, and one child of type omega. Okay? So you know, you won't care about these specific values like 5 and 3. So those are the counts, and then you can write out the probability without going into the detail of this computation, but as we, do, as we can use for some thinning, and these values, uh, these counts, to write the probability. This brings us to the last section of my talk. I have enough time for it. Uh, and this is concerning a different set of properties. So as I said, this is a mouthful to state. It's the existential monadic second order property. So, but I'll keep referring to it as EMSS. Okay, so I'll give you an introduction to what EMSS stands for, and then I'll ask the two questions that we're trying to answer, and then answer these questions. Okay. So if I have to give you a one-line introduction to what EMS stands for, well, it allows, first of all, there should be an existential here. So it allows existential quantification over, and this is crucial, subsets of vertices. So unlike first order properties, this actually allows quantification over subsets of vertices, so it actually is able to capture more global information. Okay? As we will see, for example. So here's a somewhat informal definition of EMSOs. Uh, there is a set theoretic way of describing this, but I think this is more pertinent and better for visualization. Um, so if an EMSO property holds, then it typically states, states the following. So uh, there is, so for some positive integer r, there is an r coloring of the vertices of the tree, so that a certain first order property p holds, where the first order property does not just concern the previously encountered relations equality and parent-child relationship, but it also concerns the colors of the vertices. So what do I mean by that? So this P will actually give me a set of deterministic rules so that if I know the how many children of each color I have, then I can tell uh, what color I will be. Okay? So here's an example. Suppose you're considering two colors, red and green, uh, let's say a node is green if and only if it has at least one green child. And suppose the root is green. So if, the, if all this holds, well, then, so here's the root, say. If it is green, as we have stated here, the root has to be green, then it must have, according to the rule, at least one green child. So that's right here. And then, because this is green, it must have another green child. So. It goes on like this, so you actually get an infinite bound. So this property actually corresponds to the survival of the tree. Okay? Um, survival is therefore an EMSO, and our questions actually center around this particular property. Okay? A question in, in the rest of the talk. Okay, so survival is EMSO, which means that you can actually express survival in terms of existential quantification of our subjects of vertices, followed by some first order property holding. So when you take the complementation of survival, which is finite, the negation of it, then all the existential quantifiers flip to universal quantifiers. But that's not to say, that's not a proof of whether finiteness can also be expressed as an EMS or not. A priori, but just by looking at it, you cannot tell. So the question that Professor Spencer asked and I was able to answer is that, is finiteness also expressible as an EMS? Despite the fact that, fi that finiteness is a complement property of an EMSO property, which is survival. Okay. Um, so, I, so I should just mention a little bit that his inspiration also came from this NP not equal to coin behind of problems. So, uh, so we answer, uh, I answered this question in the negative. So finiteness is not expressible as an EMSO, uh, and the proof is again using a version of the Arendt-Foyt games, which is slightly different from the version we encountered before. But we'll describe that. So, in particular, this helps us conclude the following. Is that about NP not equals So, Professor Spencer keeps referring this to this NP not equals to co-NP, and inspiring me with, like, you know, this NP is a... Cohen, this is Oh, that complements rough analogy. That things are 
whether things are closed and the complementation or not, complementation or not which is exactly what this one shows that EMS was not closed under complementation. We did in the complement of survival that is not in not an EMS property. So, yeah. uh, okay. No, it is not an EMS. Though. So, so when you try to show that something is expressible, then you just express it. But when you're trying to show that something is not expressible, you actually show that there is no way that it will actually boil down to an EMS property. So, it's not like an there is an Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, should I, oh, should I only an analogy. <laughs> uh, so here's the description of the game. So, this game can be described in a more general setting, but I'm just talking about this as we would require it for our group. So, once again, it's it's a full information game, but played between two players. Uh, spoiler and duplicator. So we start with a finite tree T1 and an infinite tree T2. So, and then they have the spe their special rules. There's a number of rounds K, and there are R colors. This is the additional parameter. So there are two kinds of rounds now. The first one is the set round or the coloring round. Okay, so here there's a reason why I've written this in red and gold. So the spoiler for this round does not have the liberty to move back and forth between two, two trees. He must color the finite tree, and let's call it coloring sigma 1. And the duplicator in reply must color uh, the infinite tree, and let's call that coloring sigma 2. So uh, I'll exp I, if, uh, if you guys ask, then I'll explain why that's, uh, that's the right way to do it. To do it. And then uh, then it is followed by vertex rounds or pebble rounds, which are similar to what we encountered before. So they are key rounds, and the spoiler regains his freedom of moving back and forth between the two trees. So he can choose a node from either T1 or T2 in every round, and the beginner must choose a node from the other tree in that round. So we stick to the same notation. So Xi is the node selected from T1 and Y from T2 in the ith round. Uh, and we again have this convention of setting the zero pair of nodes to be the roots. So duplicator wins the game now if she can maintain not two but three conditions. So the parent-child relationship as before, the equality of nodes as before, but now she also must maintain the colors of the nodes. So Xi under sigma one must get the same color as Ya under sigma two. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the notation for the game. So we have this additional parameter R. Yeah. Since you mentioned, so why why is there no freedom in the? Oh, so okay. So, so what we're trying to show is that if there is an EMS which holds for the finite tree, then it holds for the infinite tree. So, if the spoiler starts coloring T1, then that gives you an EMS on the finite tree T1, and duplicator by winning the game shows that that also holds for the infinite tree. On the other hand, if the spoiler starts with coloring the infinite tree. Well, the infinite tree already has the, pr the property survival, which is EMSO, and which is not true for finiteness. So duplicator has no way of winning the game. Okay. So okay. Um, what is the connection with that question? So for every uh, my values of R and K, I want to be able to find a finite T1 and an infinite T2 so that duplicator wins the corresponding game on these two things. And that would show that finiteness is not in EMSO. So I'm not going to go into the proof, but let me show the construction uh, for this problem. So the finite tree, T1, the root has like many, 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 many children, and then each of them has this long part of like capital D coming out of them. So we first determine capital D as a function of R and K, and then we determine M as a function of R, K, and D. Uh, and the infinite tree has the same thing. So it has this. This is the. This is exactly isomorphic to T1. But then the root has an additional child that has an infinite path coming out. Okay. So what's the point of this? So well, if spoiler colors, no matter how spoiler colors this tree, because there are many copies of this path, some pattern gets repeated sufficient number of times, and I make use of that pattern to color the infinite path. And on these paths, I just duplicate whatever the spoiler has done. So that's. A hand waving winning strategy, but this was complicated and it did, uh, did take a lot of work. So, but as you can see, like this is a really pathological tree. So, of course, because you are having an infinite path here, 
this under Poisson lambda Galton Watson measure has, has probability zero. So the next question that we want to ask, which, is, which should be more interesting to probabilists, is the following. So is it possible that we can get rid of a bad set of infinite trees that are of measure zero, so that on the rest, finiteness does boil down to an EMS property? So in other words, if you could get rid of trees like that, the, the pathological trees. So is finiteness almost surely an EMSL? So we answered the question in the negative again. So it's not almost surely an EMSL. And the specific uh, statement is the following. So given R and K, we construct a finite T1 and a family script T2 of infinite trees, which is positive measure, so that the duplicator for any member capital T2 of script T2 wins the corresponding game on T1 and T2. So this is joint work with Andrew Holroyd of Microsoft, uh, Redmond, uh, Avi Levy, who's a friend from the University of Washington, and Professor Spencer himself. So uh, if I'm to get just a feel of how we go about this proof, we don't have paths in that case, or not just paths. We look at other possible subtrees. So we get hold of a finite collection of finite subtrees, which are in some set, it's in some sense bad, and like you know they, they create pro problems. We have many, many copies of them on either side. And then instead of the infinite path, we just have a galton watson tree condition on survival. And then uh, duplicator finds a clever way of coloring infinite tree. OK, so uh, acknowledgments. This is the longest slide, I think. So how do you bow? I have never bowed in my life to Professor Spencer, who is my advisor, Professor Austin, who is almost like an informal co-advisor. So, uh, Dr. Sindhubi Professor Tobias Johnson, Toby, and Fiona, Dr. Fiona Skirman from the University of Bristol, who we, so I'm working with Toby and Fiona on really interesting questions, fingers crossed. Uh, the Dr. Professor Myung Kang and uh, Dr. Oliver Cooley of uh, TU Graz in Austria, who I'm also working with on CLTs of giant components in regular random hypergraphs but where the connectivity is not vortex connectivity. So again, fingers crossed. Uh, Andrew Holroyd, uh, Yuval Paris of Microsoft Research Redmond, uh, Alvi Levy of University of Washington. Uh, so we're writing up the previous result that I just showed in the previous slide uh, in paper, so we should slap. Professor Maxim Zukovsky uh, of uh, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology who I'm working with currently and who I was supposed to visit, but I can't because of visa problems. Uh, <laughs> Christian Molik, uh, my master's thesis advisor, and probably the first person to really inspire me in probability uh, from Indian Statistical Institute. I love you guys. Um, <laughs> so very hurtful thanks to my, my family. It's, uh, I think my family is super supportive and more concerned with my education than I am myself. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks to my parents, my grandparents, uh, my aunt, uncle, and cousin. So lots of hugs to my friends who tolerate me every day, uh, especially Teresa, who has been stuck with me in the same office, and Sylvester, who I'm very proud of. He's the NSF postdoc this year, and he's going to UCLA. Um, this guy here, who is my friend from childhood and who is this year's SRAM fellow, so I'm very, very proud of him. He's finishing up his PhD in statistics in Stanford. So, I've not mentioned many, many people, but they're super important. Uh, thank you. Here's my scholarship. I think I took, I took most time to create this. <laughs> so uh, the protocol, we can open up for questions from anybody and uh, everybody, and then we'll uh, ask everyone to uh, step outside, and we'll just have to committee here, and then we'll ask Monty to step outside, and the committee will meet, and, uh, and then we'll see what happens. But first, it's, it's open for if anybody else has more questions about it. Should I be in the picture or not be in the picture? There we go. <laughs> yeah, picture. Sure. Okay. You have a question. Okay, oh. nice hour, we? Why don't you wait till we're meeting as the committee? Okay. So, thank you all for attending. Yeah, and thanks I, so much. Particular thanks for the graduate students. I think it's so important to be supportive of each other, and uh, and you enjoy this. So, thank you very much.
Okay. We'll have everyone take their leave except for the committee members. And you can sit down if you want. You don't have to stand. <laughs> Thank you for that. I should stop broadcasting. <laughs>